Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, YDA Week 2021. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone here. I'm Gabriel Humphreys, Project Manager for YDA 2021. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you not only to YDA Week, but to this live presentation on human AI symbiosis in media. Um, our theme for this year's YDA Week is freedom. Um, and in that spirit, in this presentation, we're going to be exploring um, artificial intelligence, the media industry, and um, freedom. <laughs> uh, and with us today, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, an award-winning extended reality artist and uh, researcher at the Toronto York University, uh, Michaela Panesikova, who will be taking us through this presentation. Um, yes, fantastic. So I will hand over to Michaela now, um, who's going to talk to us about human AI symbiosis in media. Michaela, thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel, for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, so that there's there's some, you see all, not only my face, but also <laughs> something else. Um, so share sound, optimize for video clip. There we go. Um, yeah, so as Gabriel said, we're going to talk, or I'm going to talk to you about human AI symbiosis in media. And the main question is, is it freedom? Does it give more freedom, the collaboration between us and AI, or is it sort of an imprisonment in disguise? And maybe this is a question that I will not be able to answer right away but maybe that's also something that we can talk about later during the Q&A. Um, yeah, here's a short video to introduce the talk. Hello, Hello everyone. I am, I am here to tell you that I was created by a type of AI called Generative Adversarial Network. And Michaela is going to talk to you about the usage of AI in media. Enjoy. So, as you can see, um, this is um, this. I'm not sure whether you can see it, but this is a complete synthetic human. So this this person doesn't exist. Um, it's a deep fake, um, and her voice is also a deep fake. So it's a synthetic voice, and a an artificial intelligence created human. Uh, as she mentions, it, she's, she's created through generative adversarial networks. I will talk about different types of AI later on. Um, and, but maybe I want to already um, um, kind of uh, give a little bit of, of introduction to the focus of the talk where I will give examples of different companies that are using um, using AI in media industry. And so Synthesia is, is um, a company that offers several thousand, several, several um, or many uh, digital humans um, such as uh, this one. And sh they, they um, also provide up to 50 languages, I think. So you can write a text and uh, when you when you um, buy in the software, um, the 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 um, artificially created human will basically tell what you tell them to do. It's a sort of a puppet. Um, you can use this like this in a presentation or in um, on your website. Uh, um, you know, th there's like in advertising, there's many uses where digital humans can be used and I will talk about it further later. Um, but first, what is AI actually? So I will, I will start, I will quote Alan Turing, who you might know, he's a math he was a mathematician in the 40s and 90, uh, 1940s and 1950s. Um, um if you saw the film Imitation Game, that's Alan, it was about Alan Turing. Um, and so Alan Turing started asking the question of what it means to, 
to be, what, what does it mean um, to create artificial intelligence? And so he's asking, can a machine be built that would behave within certain narrow parameters in a manner indistinguishable from a human? Um, it's a, it's, it might seem like an easy questions, question, but as you could previously see, um, it's not that easy. Um, we, I don't think that we have yet generated um, even a chatbot, although GPT through from OpenAI is nearly there, that could kind of fool us um, by um, pre um, pretending that it is human. And also the question is, do we need it to to sound and, and look like that human? Do we need that? So that's another question that might be for further discussion. Um, and so he elaborates and says, could one make a machine which would answer questions put to it in such a way that it could not be possible to distinguish its answers from those of a man? Could one make a machine which would have feelings like you and I do? And so here we add not a, he, he adds Alan Turing adds not only the you know the, the 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 human AI interaction and the communication aspect but it also he also adds feeling affect and emotions and that's the big issue with AI Margaret Bodden uh, says on the other hand um, AI seeks to make computers do sort of things human minds can do. And this is also, again, a questionable quote, um, because maybe we want AI to do actually not things that our minds can do. We rather want AI to do things that we cannot do so that maybe we can extend uh, our human minds um, and actually our smartphones are already partly uh, the extension of, of, of our mind in a way, because for instance, if you have a, have a phone and there, there you have your numbers and, and contacts and your calendar, this is all the things that you don't have to remember because the machine remembers. Um, so th this is what they called the uh, call, what, uh, two presumptions of AI. Um, so there are two presumptions that have underwritten AI projects. The first of these is the primacy of cognition. It is capacities like thinking, information processing, problem solving, decision making, reasoning, pattern recognition, and perception that have been fabricated in, in classical AI. New AI contends that sensory, perceptual, and corporeal data form the frame within which cognitive faculties emerge. The skills and competencies that develop in an artificial entity as it engages directly with the world generate a distributed intelligence that is robust and responsive and has, capacity, uh, and has the capacity for growth. Um, so again, this is, there's this big question of emotion and as well as consciousness. And this is where we are still not that far when creating AI uh, software. Um, so what do we understand <laughs> under AI? Um, narrow AI um, is focused on one narrow task. It is construct, con contrasted with strong AI, which is defined as a machine with the ability to apply intelligence to any problem rather than just one specific problem, sometimes considered to require consciousness, sentience, and mind. So here we go back to what Turing is asking. You know, can a can a machine? Can you think what I feel? Can you feel what I think? And so, I would strongly um, suggest, <laughs> in my opinion, that we are not even in the general strong AI. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, because 
um, the artificial intelligence we've been using is mostly concerned just like with solving one task. You cannot, let's say, if you have a, a general adversarial network and you train it with thousands of boots um, to create new boots, let's say new shoes, um, I guess you cannot tell, tell it to, to find the cure for AIDS because you know you trained it it will only spit out the data that you trained it with um so so there's um so strong ai cannot um or strong ai is a feeling is 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 a part is a is a type of ai which has already possibly human aspects such as sentience and consciousness and then there's the super ai which you know we are all afraid of uh, in uh, in quotation marks uh, which is you know uh, those are the sci-fi films about the ai and the robots that come and destroy us that's the character of her in the film her that super ai i am very skeptical that we will ever come to that part um, and so more concretely in, uh, in uh, uh, let's say technical terms, um, artificial intelligence um, is basically any kind of data processing and calculations based on those data that let's say human brain cannot do. So it's, I would say AI in the simplest form is a sort of, data calculator. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's, um, of course, machine learning, there, there's um, machine learning, which is um, already a sort of, it's, it's data processing through, uh, through algorithms, who, which make models, and then predict results. So it's, a, it's a method of data analysis that automates analytical uh, model building. Um, and basically the mach machine learning uh, processes are unsupervised learning processes. So there is no need for uh, the human to intervene and the processes just learn by themselves. The adjective, and so and, uh, like the most um, complex version of AI now, nowadays, it's, it's deep learning, uh, where the adjective deep in deep learning refers to the use, uh, to the use of multiple layers in the network. And these are called neural networks. And this is, neural networks are built in an attempt to uh, simulate how human brain works but that's also a, a great misconception because a misconception um, because human brain is yet still too uh, complex to figure it out. Even now, neuroscience is not there yet to tell us specifically how you know memory and how consciousness, for instance, works. Um, although these are, of course, uh, being researched right now at the moment. Um, nonetheless, neural networks um, like give rise to, uh, to pretty complex artificial intelligence processes. And I will try to explain a little bit about what neural networks do. And so this is, for instance, an example of uh, a generative adversarial network. So for instance, how, how the the digital human who was talking at the beginning was created. So on the left side, you have data that we feed the, the software with. Um, then the, the, the second on the left, that's where um, the first, um, uh, the first network um, intervenes. Th those are the algorithms that creates models and patterns, um, 
patterns of of like let's say what a what a an airplane is or what a car is or what a dog is and then it's it tries this this uh this first network tries to um create these these forms of objects let's say and the uh, that's why it's called the generator but then it's applied within um, another network that is called discriminator and the discriminator um, um, is basically um, sorting out those that doesn't that uh, those images that let's say don't re uh, resemble any of the of the cars or 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 dogs and the task of the generator network is to fool the discriminator so that it creates images that are nearly non-distinguishable between between you know the the uh, originals the data that we fed the network with with the results which is which are represented in the column uh, on the right so it's sort of a game between these two these networks where one is trying to fool the other here i am i it's it's um, again, a sort of uh, concrete, more concrete example of these kind of networks, um, where you know it's it's the, the generative AI and and deep learning and machine learning are for instances of let's say the computer vision, generative adversarial networks or natural language processing, and what what we can do with them is for instance, you know, face recognition, mode recognition. Thanks to that, we can develop digital humans. We can make deep fakes, which, you know, uh, videos of, of <laughs> presidents that tell us things that might not be true. Deep Dream, which is a, a creative software to, cre uh, to produce art, prediction software such as you being used in predictive policing, also questionable, uh, but sometimes, you know, depending on what you predict, it might be really um, effective, such as, let's say, uh, predicting of, of um, behavior in people, um, as well as prediction software does a lot of um, good in pharmaceutical industry. GPT-2, GPT-3, and different translation softwares are part of natural language processing. And DAL-E, uh, which is also um, Elon Musk's open AI product, uh, combines GPT-3, uh, a natural language software, processing software, with computer vision and generative adversarial networks. Um, and I will talk about it in a bit. And now another video just to show you what you can do um, now with digital humans. I am a meta human, the next generation of digital human powered by Unreal Engine. Metahumans are high-fidelity digital characters created by you, the user, on our new content creation platform, Metahuman Creator. I am fully rigged, ready for animation and motion capture, allowing you to work in context. With everything running live in Unreal Engine, my motion works seamlessly. On other characters, I have eight levels of detail and have been tested on a wide range of hardware platforms, on feature filmed, the mobile, if you're interested in learning about my animation rig or high fidelity deformations built on control rig, the new strand based hair system via the groom component, or how everything is tied together and animated in sequencer, then have a look under the hood in this project. This is just a glimpse of things to come. Oh, sorry for that. There we go. Um, 
so so these these characters were created uh, are the new are were launched by Unreal Engine, which is a game engine. Um, one of the large ones on the market together with Unity. Um, and they launched it earlier this year, the MetaHumans, um, which are now actually downloadable for free, 50 of them. So actually, if you're working with Unreal Engine, um, you can test them out and you know start training them and, and um, reading them. And yeah, for now, they, they um, function as sort of 3D model puppets, but I'm pretty sure it, AI, uh, AI will be applied, to, um, like different forms of AI will be applied to, to them. But of course they were created with all the, um, the, 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 the imaging and the computer vision AI processes. And so AI, uh, what I would say, I will now uh, progress to the topic of freedom and creative freedom and sort of what does it mean to be in a symbiosis between human and AI? And what does it mean to be an augmented human? So I think in the first, um, firstly, it's important to note down that I, I don't think that AI is here to overcome us, the super AI fantasy is still a big sci-fi. I think AI is here to augment us, to extend our minds, to extend our bodies. And as I mentioned already earlier, smartphones are already, you know, um, tools to um, augment us. So for now, AI is not self-conscious. Self it doesn't feel but AI can do more that human minds can do. So, you know, calculating and processing thousands, millions of data that we cannot, our brains cannot do, remembering, storing, you know, um, and predicting and analyzing, of course. Um, but what AI is missing is the embodiment. So human knowledge is embodied. A human experience is embodied. We feel through our bodies and we feel also through our brains and it, we are all interconnected. And so this is where many philosophers ask the questions, where does the conscience come from? And the answer lies it, it, it possibly in basically the connection between the body and the mind, which AI is missing. Um, so what if we think of AI as something that can complete us? What if, what if AI is here not to overpower us, but to augment us? And what if AI augments also our creativity? So can we become more creative and more free um, to create art through um, collaboration with AI. Um, I'm going to show you a, a short video of Rafik Anadol's work. Uh, it's a data sculpture and yeah, enjoy. Anadol is 
this is happening. Anyway, Rafik Anadol, this is another, um, another piece that he made. Uh, he uses data as his primary material and he creates site-specific sculptures, live audiovisual performances and immersive installations that encourage us to rethink our engagement with the physical world, its temporal and spatial dimensions and the creative potential of machines. He's of Turkish descent and, you know, one of big, uh, uh, huge AI artists at the moment. So now the question, what is creativity? Nobody can really answer that. Uh, it's, it's more, you know, it's more a question to think about. Um, but I think creativity, um, Creativity is linked to the idea of freedom, of artistic freedom, but also fantasy freedom. Dreaming, you know, uh, we are free in our dreams and we can be creative in our dreams as well. Dreams are very important for creativity. So, um, so I, I was thinking of what are the limitations to, and what are the freedoms um, between uh, of creativity and AI and our collaboration with AI? So on the one hand, it gives us, AI gives us a lot of like endless possibilities um, of creating things. Um, however, there's an issue of privacy. privacy. So um, what data we use to train those algorithms? what predictions we used and how, how it influences our privacy. For instance, now during COVID times, um, facial recognition software has become very, very important. And that has been then used like in order to train it to recognize faces with masks on. Uh, it has been then used by, for instance, Chinese government in Hong Kong to uh, recognize the protesters, although, although they were wearing masks. So, you know, there's good and bad. Um, through collaboration of human and AI, we, you know, we give it consciousness. We give, we, we, we are conscious and we give, we give it also individuality and originality. On the other hand, if we believe that whatever AI produces is true, that can become naturally manipulative. AI is usually biased. That's that. There's, there's basically, if you feed AI large amount of one data, let's say if I feed it only women and no men, it will produce only women, um, women faces. It will not produce men faces. Um, so there's always, you know, like AI is, um, is built on patterns and on finding the most general patterns in data. So I think I'm a I'm a <laughs> I'm a big fan of collaboration with AI, and this is also what I do in my work. But also, I think it's important for us to know its limitations. And so now I will talk about a couple of softwares. Uh, pieces of software that they use in the uh, media industry um, to, let's say, predict the success of film, which is, you know, um, uh, the, the image you see now, it's a, it's a software, it's a company called Synalytic, and they predict, um, so they predict the, the future success and marketing um, of a film project. Now the question is, do we, you know, if we create art, you know, and and what is like? There's a huge discussion. Of course, we we th we question what is art, what is mass media, but I have the feeling that if we if if we use this kind of prediction software to predict success and to feed um, to, the, to the as large audience as possible um, and, and want to satisfy the largest audience possible, we will come up with 
projects that are that might be boring and original um, and very um, generative. So I think um, there is maybe using this kind of software might rather show what can be improved in that project, for instance, why it's not sellable, why it's not sellable to certain certain uh, audience group, and thus go back to let's say to the script and 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 see whether you know let's say whether we can engage more women um, in the audience. Let's say you know build a better female character or um, have more diverse characters in order. Uh, so, so we can engage more audience. So I think these kind of uh, software should rather be used as a way to improve, but also to see the the the, the limits of it. Another uh, software is uh, Scriptbook, which is exactly that. Uh, it's a company that provides a software that analyzes. Uh, uh, the script at the very beginning. And it will tell you, okay, uh, this is a script that can reach 65% of female audience, that this is a 91% likable character. Um, again, I don't think that the, that the aim is to create a script that will satisfy everybody that, you know, you will because you cannot have a 100% uh, likable character because characters are, we can empathize with characters only because they are flawable, they, they have flaws. And if they're perfect, then we don't empathize because then they become gods, right? Um, and so even superheroes are, 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 aren't flawless. Um, and so I think maybe, this kind of analysis um, can be used also for for analyzing the software in a in uh, analyzing the script in a positive way, such as you know they provide the Bechtel test. Uh, what is the Bechtel test? Uh, Bechtel test is where um, it's it's testing whether in a film you have two female characters that are not talking about men or love. And so very few Hollywood movies may pass this test. Um, you can also, you know, see, you know, the percentage of diverse, like when you have your script analyzed through the software, you can see how much screen time, let's say different roles have. So how, how much screen time does, does the male role have? How much screen time does the female role game? How much screen time does the black person have? And if you see again that that the, there's let's say a very big imbalance, you can of course um, improve it. And so I think these pieces of software are here more for improvement and 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 help us to write something that is that is maybe less biased and more diverse. And but we have to take the risk of not being uh, mass attractive to everyone. So now I will talk a little bit, about it. this is the last part of the, of the session, of the talk, and I will talk a little bit about, about digital humans and deepfakes. Um, And I'll show you the video. This is another piece where a digital human was created um, through data collection um, of, a, of a child who died and of a mother who meets her in virtual reality.기술은 되게 차가운 거라고 생각하는데 그게 아니고 이 기술들이 사람을 위해서 사용이 됐을 때 정말 사람의 마음을 어, 위로하고 그 마음을 따뜻하게 만들 수 있을까라는 취지에서 저희가 프로젝트 참여를 결정했었던 부분이고요. 기억 속 
그리운 누군가가 있나요? 어, 일단 나연이가 어머니와 만났을 때 어, 그냥 바라보기만 하는 게 아니고 인터랙션이 있는 그런 부분을 좀 중점적으로 생각을 했었기 때문에 저희가 실시간 렌더링 기반의 그 프로그램을 활용해서 어, 프로젝트 개발을 진행을 했고요. So another form, this is, um, I mean, this is a very touching uh, project, but also it's ethically questionable, right? Um, if you um, if you die, who has the power and the ownership of your data to make a digital human out of you? This is a question that hasn't been resolved, for instance, in legal systems. And so um, another, another example of using uh, a digitally made AI character is, for instance, the Angley's Gemini, Gemini Man, where Will Smith um, kind of fights against his younger self. And now the question is, and I tried to Google, I tried to research the question, who owns Will Smith's younger self, dig digital self. Who owns this, you know, after the film was made, um, they basically created a young Will Smith that could possibly play another in other films. And so the question is now, does Will Smith own his younger self? Is it the production company? Is it the, you know, is it the, uh, the studio, the the the, the um, AI studio that developed the character. So these questions: Who owns the copyright to our digital selves? These questions hasn't haven't been solved yet, and this is something that ethically is still not um, answered. So who has agency? And of course, the question is. Um, you know, if if let's say we start using artificial models in advertising industry, um, it's not only that uh, that the models lose their jobs, but also you know actors and models uh, they add their personas to the characters, right? Um, and so if you if you create if you create the virtual character, the agency goes back goes to the director, to the studio, to the production, and it goes away from the performer. And the question is, do we, do we want that? Um, the last part that I want to show you is um, OpenAI. Uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, Elon Musk, uh, Musk's project. Um, and basically, uh, they developed a natural language processing so software code called GPT-2 and then GPT-3. And if when, when you go to their website, you can, for instance, through um, the connected natural language processing and computer vision and image processing. And so you can um, let the produce, let the software produce um, products that you would like so I think this is also like a big um, big change in product design right in in uh, anything in in design and architecture as well um, so yeah I uh, <laughs> entered a pentagonal red toilet and a box made of clouds which one do you like more? <laughs> I, I like more the pentagonal red toilet. I think some of them are really actually pretty cool. So I would I would buy one. Um, they also you can also use the software to create new logos and new new um, new types of uh, you know uh, new logos, new types of writing. Yeah. So that's. Um, yeah, that's one of the usages. And last but not least, um, I will quote Andy Clark, who is a, a philosopher of, of mind and um, a cognitive scientist. Um, 
but I will do it in a form of a deep fake, which I created for you. Um, sorry for the low resolution, it's open source code. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's free, but um, it's fun to make it. So enjoy. It is our basic human nature to annex, exploit, and incorporate non-biological stuff deep into our mental profiles. That is, the mind is not confined to the brain, the skull, or even the boundaries of the biological body. It takes up tools and technologies out in the world in order to expand cognitive space. Various kinds of deep human machine symbiosis really do expand and alter the shape of the psychological processes that make us who we are. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michaela. That was absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. That was, deep fake was <laughs> really incredible at the end. Um, I just, I love it. I think it's such a, this of course comes with so many ethical implications, but it's also such a, in a way, joyful <laughs> kind of method of messing with reality. Um, thank you so, so much. Um, I'll just look if we have any questions. Um, so um, I just wanted to ask you just in your opinion, um, I find that Alan Turing quote really interesting and I found the concept of the Turing test um, quite interesting for a while because I feel like um, that's obviously like a really interesting question and a very philosophical question really. But um, do you think that Alan Turing and people who were working at his time on the very early computers ever imagined the level of kind of um, the, the lower level AI um, the kind of narrow focus AI. Do you think they ever imagined that we would live in a world really dominated by so much of that? I would say yes. I think yeah. I think Alan Turing, because you know, with the Turing test, it it gets simplified in the way you know it's that is about it, it is mostly about communication and language, which is not true. Um, and that's why I was also quoting his his thoughts on thinking and feeling, and that's that is something that we still haven't encou encountered. There is no such AI that can empathize, um, yeah. and so I think that's that's where all the as you said, Gabriel, that that's a big philosophical question because singularity, the you know the AI <laughs> singularity concept. Um, it comes from the ability that AI could have consciousness, but because we still don't know how our consciousness works, <laughs> yeah, how can we program mm -hmm. something yeah. that has consciousness? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I think for him, uh, you know, like that even the Turing test, of course, if it's simplified, every chatbot. Like every, yeah. like even Siri would, <laughs> yeah. would pass yeah. in a way, you know, like Siri can be like, sometimes I'm angry at Siri and I say like, you know, Siri go to hell, screw you. And she says, Michaela, I don't deserve this, you know? So she, <laughs> I made this, I make these tests with, with AI. I'm, yeah. yeah, we're, yeah, anyway. And, <laughs> and so in the simple form, sure chatbots will pass that now as well as you know we have you know machines win chess and 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 board games mm. but on but it gets it goes deeper than that it's about consciousness oh. and feeling and empathy and we're not there yet so yeah so absolutely. i think that's what he predicted that it's a long way mm. yeah yeah um i also thought it was uh, when, when you were talking about meta humans and um the human beings that have been created completely um not from nothing but uh not just a deep fake of a real person but created from machine data from data rather um do you think there's been more interest in that since the start of hate to mention it the pandemic because of the limitations on filming with real people and of creating media with real people 
Yes, yes, you, you're completely right. I mean, it's so many, I mean, me personally, because I used to be a film producer before, a documentary film producer. Mm. And yeah. I'm so happy that during the pandemic that I already, you know, beforehand, I already transferred to, to virtual reality and extended reality and AI. Because during the pandemic, I was able to work, whereas the filmmakers who, yeah. you know, who, who use live actors and especially with documentary, I was thinking, oh my God, mm. this is, you know, this might be the end of documentary filmmaking. Of course, I was uh, a little bit hysterical at the beginning, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the usage, the usage of, I think there's, there's good and, I mean, I don't know whether you saw Gemini Man, and I think Gemini Man so. is a great yeah. example. Yeah, and I and I have to say, I mean, still you can discern the real Will Smith and the digital Will Smith, but um, the the you can actually use. And this was the question I posed: like, who owns yeah. digital Will Smith? Because yeah. you could use now the data that like the 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 digital human they created they could have him play in any kind of film and now the yeah. question is you know um, is he a puppet or mm. is will smith you know co-owner so like let's say will smith for instance how they made the gemini man was that they tracked Will Smith motion, uh, there was motion tracking in, in his face, and then they applied the, the um, digitally the, the mask on it. Mm -hmm. And so Will Smith was a big part, big part of the digital yeah. human, because he gave all the facial expressions to it. Um, but now they, they tracked it, they tracked so many expressions that actually they can, they can make their own uh, digital human yeah. without without mm. him. So I think these are very, very possible, very real questions and 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 realities mm. that yeah. Yeah. I think this is where, where film production is also going because it gets also cheaper, right? Virtual production is so much. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. At, the, at the moment, of course, like with photogrammetry and oh, the big studios uh sure it can get expensive but still it's it's much cheaper doing it in a studio and virtually than in, in real life so so i yeah. think that's that's very real that it's coming and the question is the question is the uh, the copyright so yeah. i think that's yeah. neat that needs that needs to to be sorted sorted out legally, because also like mm. what does it mean? Like let's say an agency that represents Will Smith, do they represent? Well, yeah, I was going to ask. Does, does Will Smith's Smith? agent have to book for young Will Smith as well? <laughs> yeah, exactly. See? Yeah. And mm. so I was I was researching about this a lot because I really wanted to know who owns Will Smith Young Self, <laughs> and I couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't. No. no. It's really interesting because I've seen things about um, people who have passed away and their likeness being used. For instance, I think Prince and Michael Jackson have both given virtual concerts. Um, I think Michael Jackson actually appeared at the MVAs, um, at the MTV, sorry, awards quite a while ago as a hologram. Um, but I mean, then when it becomes living people, that's so obviously so much more complicated. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, so. um how I was gonna ask you actually, how did you get started in kind of the world of uh, extended reality and artificial intelligence? It was actually through a documentary. Um yeah. I was uh I was producing for I was a producer uh in a German documentary production company and we were making this film about predictive policing and mm. during the development of of the film i got really deep into predictive policing and predictive algorithms and predictive ai and then we made 
a small app, a small predictive policing app that simulated predictive policing software, which we launched together with the with the film called Pre-Crime. And we made this small app called Pre-Crime Calculator. And that's how it started. Basically, I got hooked on like basically interactive media and also yeah. why VR is so important to me because it's so immersive and I'm a theater person. I studied originally theater. So mm. I film was for me too 2D too dimensional d dimensional. Yeah. I needed yeah. 3D yeah. and movement and embodiment. So yeah, that's that's how it mm. started. Yeah. And what's the kind of XR work you do now, if you don't mind me asking? So uh, we just actually we um, we launched last year um, a project called Symphony of Noise VR, which mm. is a VR. It's based on Matthew Herbert's book, The Music. I don't know whether you know him. He used to be a, a, a 90s techno guru <laughs> but he's also a sound cool. documentarian yeah and so we use this book where he basically creates soundscapes in the book it's a it's a story through sound it's a novel through sound and i found it and it was again through this production company we also we were making fil a film about matthew herbert which is going to be released this september and again i thought well, there, I mean, there's like so much to sound, so much more to sound than seeing it in a cinema. Like sound mm -hmm. is, can be spatial. What happens to sound when we include our bodies? What happens with the sound when we interact through our bodies in immersive space and co-create with, yeah. you know, algorithmic processes and AI a world of sound. And so yeah. Symphony of Noise is this VR experience where you where you um, create sounds in a VR space and interact with objects. And then the algorithms take it from you and uh, reproduce it, but in a different way. And at the end, all sounds come together in a, in a score that is kind of personal to you. So mm. to every people, person's uh, own uh, like old, own personal self and uh, yeah we will we are releasing the beta version on steam this summer so uh, yeah it's uh, it's it's had a lovely lovely festival run and now it's time for for do it doing it uh, releasing it uh, yeah. for home yeah viewers Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Michaela. I think that's all of our um, questions. Um, what really struck me as well just throughout was that I, I agree with you that AI is a really powerful tool, but that has limitations and um, has dangers too. But I thought it was really interesting that um, we ask, we, we kind of came to this presentation asking the question of whether AI was responsible. But to me, it well, a lot of what you were saying, it struck me that it's a question of whether human beings are responsible, not whether AI is responsible, and how we use AI and how we use it to better what we're doing rather than to confirm our biases and restrict ourselves. And yeah. Thank you. That's a, if, if that came across, then I'm happy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, Michaela. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Enjoy the week. And uh, it was a pleasure to be invited here. Yeah, Bye.